Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Anish Chakravarti Ji, Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Kamala Nehru College, University of Delhi, and our chairperson, Venerable Geshe Doji Dandula, Director of Tabith House Cultural, Cultural Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, New Delhi. And with this, I would like to welcome each and every one of you for taking out your valuable time at the same time assembling here for today's monthly lecture on this very topic, which is on the dialectical method of Sanjay Balatiputta, an ascetic who debated with several of his contemporaries, including Lord Buddha, um, for which I would like to convey my sincere gratitude and admiration to Dr. Anish Chakravarti Ji for taking this initiative and putting an incredible effort to gather such an intriguing history of a great Indian master who is Sanjaya Balatiputta and his great contributions in Buddhist philosophy. So now before I proceed with the session, may I give you a brief introduction about Tibet House and its contribution, various contributions and activities. So Tibet House Cultural Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama was founded in 1965 by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama to preserve and disseminate the unique cultural heritage of Tibet and provide a center for Tibetan studies. Tibet House also has a museum of valuable Tibetan arts and artifacts as well as a library. Tibet House regularly organizes lectures, conferences, exhibitions, film screening and festivals throughout the year. These programs mainly focus on Indian, Tibetan and Nalanda Buddhist history, science, religion, philosophy, art, literature and culture, where it highlights the vital and evolving heritage of the Tibetan people. Tibet House also offers different courses on Buddhist philosophy and Tibetan language courses as well. At present, a five-year master course on Nalanda Buddhist, Nalanda Buddhist philosophy has already started in July 2023 in which almost 900 participants are enrolled from 54 different countries. And there's, we have a Nalanda Diploma course, which is a one-year course. This course is designed specifically to accommodate people who are more seriously interested in Buddhist philosophy while being in the midst of busy lives in cities and towns with other engagements and commitment. Till now, we have successfully completed three batches and the fourth batch of Nalanda Diploma course is now being offered and we also have, we also offer a Tibetan language course every four months. Until now, 23 batches have passed out successfully. So I would like to request to those who are interested in learning Tibetan language from Tibet House, please do visit our website and you will find the detailed information about it. So with this, uh, before we proceed with the session, um, I would like to request uh, Venerable Geshe Doje Damdula to kindly proceed with the session. And before proceeding with the session, may I give you a brief introduction about Venerable Geshe Doji Damdula? Um, after 15 years of study in Buddhist philosophy, he finished his Geshe Harampa degree, which is equivalent to PhD in 2002 from Draping Lo Loseling Monastery Monastic University. He joined Gyume Tantric College for a year for Tantric studies. In 2003, the office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama sent him to Cambridge University, England for proficiency in English studies. He was a visiting fellow at Gurdon College, Cambridge University. In 2005, he was appointed as the official translator to His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. As assigned by the office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he visited the US in 2008 to work with Professor Paul Ekman, a world-renowned psychologist, one of the pioneers of the science of microfacial expressions, on His Holiness the Dalai Lama's book, Emotional Awareness, which is co-authored by Dr. Paul Ekman of the University of California Medical School. He has been invited to many national and international conferences and presented papers on such as the paradox of brain and mind and the ultimate reality according to Arya Nagarjuna. 
Venerable Geshe Doja Damdula is presently the director of Tibet House Cultural Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, New Delhi. This, with this, I would like to request uh, Venerable Geshe Doja Damdula to kindly proceed the session. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Kungachindala, thank you so much. And um, indeed, um, it is a great moment to witness what used to happen in the past in India, exchanges amongst the different philosophers, psychologists, for example, what and the Dr. Anish Chakravati is going to share with us is one of the very interesting interactions, exchanges, debates, discussions happening on those the in those days. And um, I know that the many of you are the say the friends of Dr. Anish Chakravati. And for those of us who are who are not who are not aware of him, I'd like to quickly share with you his the CV. Dr. Anish Chakravati has been teaching uh, the has been teaching philosophy from past one decade, and is currently working as assistant professor of philosophy at Kamala Nehru College, University of Delhi. As a PhD from the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, on Indian philosophy, he has previously been a visiting scholar at the Department of Philosophy, Heidelberg University, Germany. He has been recipient of various academic awards, including the Indian Philosophical Congress Medal and Professor Premchand Memorial Prize for standing first in MA philosophy at the University of Delhi. His research interests and publications are in the fields of Ancient Indian and Greek philosophy, philosophy of religion, metaphysics, and logic. He's interested in doing philosophy at the academic as well as at the public interface. <clears throat> and for further information, um, um, there was a constant the say mail that we received from Dr. Anish Chakravadi, and uh, and. Our secretary was constantly informing me about Dr. Anish Ji. And I said, Yes, of course, we will meet. So two of us met. And meeting him, I could see a very profound feeling of the calmness there. And uh, I was just so intrigued, so the, the impressed. This warmth there. I was so impressed. And then the. Um, the, I said, why not? Why don't you, you know, um, give a lecture here? And of course, Tibet was here because that our programs, they are almost like five days a week. So many of the the participants, uh, participants who take part in these programs, and they whenever we say that there's some, you know, the program outside the regular programs, they will say that they will take that as a holiday. For them, so therefore, um, the um, it's a little unfortunate that you know that people should hear these beautiful uh, discussions. What is happening on those days? We should know these things. I personally would say that what Doctor Anish is going to share with us here. This is what I learned in the Manas University that at times of the Buddha, these di dialogues were happening, and suddenly somebody came, a young dynamic. And the scholar came and said that, you know, this is the research that he did on. I was so intrigued. It is the um, very pleasant to see. And there's a tremendous warmth there in Professor the Anishi. So um, the, we are so fortunate that we are going to hear something of what actually happened 2,500 years ago. And today, this may not be so prevalent, but you know, what happened in the past is so important for us to know, and it's a great opportunity for us to know. So, let's all welcome Dr. Anish Chakrabadiji for this wonderful talk. We are looking forward to 
listen to you. And um, the in the end of the talk, um, we'll invite questions from the audience. Dr. Anishi, the stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, a uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, I am very, I'm almost blushing after hearing all these, uh, you know, amazing words from uh, Yeshu Rasa. Uh, first of all, I would like to just quickly share that uh, 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 he, uh, he has been my teacher and it is a sheer honor and privilege and an opportunity of a lifetime for me to be with him on the same platform. It will be a memory that I'll always cherish. So I'm really thankful to Geshila sir to give me this opportunity to be here and to present a topic on a thinker uh, which is very lesser known. And partly I'm very indebted to Tibet House that they allowed me to do that. And secondly, because uh, it is because of uh, the Bodha texts that today we know about this thinker. It is only in the main, mainly in the Bodha text that this thinker was mentioned. And, and few sources in Jainism as well mention this thinker. But largely the material that we have today about this very lesser known thinker that I'm speaking on is from the Bodha sources. So I'm very indebted to Tibet House to allow me. In a way, this thinker is not about this thinker technically, but the fact that everything that we know about him come from both the sources makes him very much a part to the tradition. And uh, I'm also thankful for to all of you for being here. I'm thankful to my colleagues, Gagan Jod, Anasuya. I'm really thankful to my students here and especially to my supervisor, Krishna Bani Patak, for being here. Thank you, sir. So I'm very happy for that. So I'll not waste more time. I'll just begin then. So uh, the topic as it has been announced is basically on the dialectical method of Sanjay Biladiputta. Now, uh, so Sanjay was, uh, is a person who has not been studied in detail, although we find his references scattered across the sources in Buddhist and in some Jain literature uh, texts. But uh, so my PhD, which I finished last year was on this thinker. It was called the logic of epistemic justification in Sanjay Agyanwad. And it was a sheer hard work of six years that I actually could collect the material of this thinker from various sources and try to weave it out into a coherent philosophical method that he advocated at that time. So historically, uh, so I might my presentation or my talk would be focusing a bit on the historical background. It would be focusing a bit on where this person was situated, how he was connected to Buddha and few other thinkers like Mahavir, and then finally what he had to say, what he had to teach, and can we learn something from him, if at all for our benefit. So uh, in any in a way, it would be a uh, uh, a small addition to the his rich history of Indian philosophy that exists, I believe. So, uh, coming to the uh, first part, uh, we see that you know Sanjay was uh, is mostly is considered as a senior contemporary of Buddha. So, uh, at, at the time when uh, Buddha was Lord Buddha was, uh, you know, trying to find truth and seek. Uh, uh, you know, some wisdom, uh, uh, Sanjay Bilati Putta was already uh, an established person and a teacher in the Magadh region uh, in which is present day Bihar. So, uh, the historical uh, introduction that I have given here is that, you know, the time when this happened, that is around 7th century BC, 7th century BC, 6th century BC, this time was when there was a lot of boon and upliftment in the in the you know knowledge systems of uh, in ancient India, it was in economics, in in culture, in commerce, in uh, philosophy, and so on. So uh, you know, so uh, among that tradition, there was a movement which arose, and historians and history students or people would know it better that there was a Shramana movement that propagated, and because of the huge literature that existed in the Indian subcontinent which was Vedic, 
and of course independent sources so there were two traditions which generally uh, continued and uh, as scholars of indian philosophy today bifurcate or try to understand and see the categorization so one were the shramanas and the other were the brahmanas so the uh, shramanas were the shramana has come from the word one who labors to see to seek the truth so all these thinkers who were freely and independently trying to seek knowledge were uh, uh, and were ascetics and monks and hermits were collectively in history were called the shramanas and the ones who were seeking these truth uh, from direct or indirect connection with the vedas were were labeled by scholars later as the brahmanas so this is how the tradition was existed the tradition was so rich that there were a lot of philosophical teleological spiritual as well as natural discussions not i mean uh, discussions related to natural sciences were happening at that time in india and then the 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 region or the time was very egalitarian because there were a lot of ideas that were propagated and the kings were very tolerant of many kinds of views that existed at that time because we can see that from the literature that we gather from of that time so uh you know so the main concern of these aesthetics and truth seekers were to find if there is any reality and if it is how it can uh how we are connected to it how and what we can do about it what we can do to our lives if we know that reality that was the general line of thought that existed so uh this is what i told you so uh in the literature of uh, philosophy and history of philosophy particularly we find that these these uh, sought the these truths that were sought were largely uh, you know divided into two sections so the one there were certain uh, ascetics and people who were trying to seek these truths through vedic knowledge either very directly or devoutedly or indirectly and they have been labeled as the brahmanas so the schools with the tradition continuing of this learning there were these six uh, you know vedic uh traditions which somewhere or the other in their literature corpuses refer to the vedas and the latter were the so somewhat liberated traditions from the vedic influences and they and they developed their philosophies and thoughts independently so in the brahmana we find the purva mimamsaka uttara mimamsaka which is properly today known as vedant sankhya yoga nyaya and vaisheshik in the shramana we find the lokayata the jain tradition the uh, the bodha the agyana which is also known as agyanavad or agyanik and ajivika so these and there were many traditions there were many sects in the shramana tradition that existed almost around maybe more than 200 but we know hardly anything about them today they have they all gone extinct so uh continuing so the thinker whom i'm talking about today sanjay was belonging to a sect called the agyana and this sect uh, has been named apparently supposedly by the other schools because uh, agyan word is generally uh, not a very does not have a very positive connotation attached to uh, knowledge so it is considered as a root of all suffering so it is believed that the school was not uh, the thought tradition that was continuing at that time which was labeled or called as agyana was not a tradition not a thought which they themselves qualified or called themselves as perhaps it was referred to as by the other schools uh, and there is a reason for it as i will explain things about sanjay and agyana darshan you will find why perhaps they were called like that so agyana or agyanika roughly in english we translate them as agnosticism so in indian philosophy indian history books you will find them to be as agnostics was a name given to certain sects of ancient shramana tradition who neither held obi uh, neither held any opinion neither denied any opinion nor affirmed or denied any opinion at the same time or even admitted that they neither affirmed or denied any opinion so they were uh, doing something which i think is very interesting uh, these thinkers on a broader basis were questioning beliefs and knowledge of all other orthodox that is the brahmana and the heterodox shramana thinkers at the time it is quite likely that this label as i told you was given by other schools because in their text we find them to be called as the agyana thinkers or the agyana ascetics moving on uh, let's understand that these agnostics they did not claim that any conclusive knowledge about any matters of debate 
many matters debated by philosophers is possible or impossible. For purposes of argument, they developed a technique of systematic evasion, what in Buddhist texts we call it as Amaravik Shepa. But generally, they appear to have deprecated argument as leading to bad tempers and loss of peace of mind. Instead, they seem to have advocated friendship and in being a non-rival, Aviruddhaka. They seem to have taught that the various kinds of thoughts, beliefs or their denial were not consistent with each other. And therefore, say, beliefs on nature of the soul or the, uh, the question on life after death and so on and so forth. Such speculation could, not, could be only confusing and harmful or lead to harmful actions such as disputes or intellectual debates and divisions leading to remorse and perhaps obstructions to peace of mind. So therefore, we should be avoiding uh, taking stands on speculative uh, you know, realities. Now, Sanjay Bhalatiputta was one such thinker of this tradition. And he is, in fact, one of the most, as per the Bodha text, he was the most prominent Agyan thinker who was perhaps the founder or the most important or the famous uh, one among this entire corpus of Agyan thinkers that existed at the time of Buddha. Now, uh, in the Bodha literature, we just don't find Agyan Darshan, but we find many individual references of the teachers. I'll just read them quickly. So, Sanjay was not the only thinker existing other than the Buddha at that time. There were many others. And in all, almost all Buddhist and Jain texts, we find Sanjay along with these other five teachers to be put as the heretical teachers. The teachers who are, or the people who were not uh, part of the main tradition, which is either is Jaina or Bodha. So we find thinkers like Purana Kasappa or Purna Kashyap who held the theory of amoralism and Ahetuvad, which basically said that there is no good or bad and there is no causes really. Causes are, is, a, is an, is an uh, empirical illusion. Then they, we had Makhali Ghoshala, who is the founder of the Ajivika sect, which is now known. He gave the doctrine of Niyativad, which was a fatalism, an absolute fatalistic philosophy, which did not allow any human freedom and agency. So, and then there was Ajita Kesha Kamli, another very important thinker, who gave the theory of annihilationism, which was basically a material thought. And then we have Pakudaka Chayana, who gave the theory of eternalism which is that says that everything exists forever, that thing perishes. So, Ajita Kesha calmly believed that everything perishes, nothing will stay forever, not even soul, not even God, there is no concept that will stay forever. And on the other hand, Kachayana said that there is nothing that perishes, things only transform into one another. So, they, they, these were kind of the debates that existed. Then there was, of course, the last thinker is the Niganth Nathaputta, which is Vardhaman Mahavir, the famous uh, 24th Tirthankar in Jainism, who of course has a very rich philosophical tradition, but basically they advocated Anikandwad, the pluralistic philosophy of reality and the fact that, that the realities are, uh, you know, have are multiple, so we should always hold the and hold the relativistic standpoint. So we should always have a kind of a siyada, that means maybe ness while we utter any truth. Moving on, now we come to Sanjay, who is the sixth thinker in the tradition as per the, about the sources and whom I have worked upon. I believe he is very different in many ways, conceptually from all of them. So when Sanjay was asked about any kind of truths in reality, this is the original stated quote attributed to him. He said, if you ask me if there exists another world after death, if I thought there exists another world, would I declare that to you? I don't think so. I don't think in that way. I don't think otherwise. I don't think not. I don't think not not. If you ask me if there is, isn't another world, both is and isn't, neither is nor isn't. If there are beings who transmigrate, that means if you pass from one birth to another, uh, if there aren't both and aren't, neither are nor aren't. If the Tathagat exists after death, doesn't, both neither exist nor doesn't exist after death. Would I declare that to you? I don't think so. I don't think in that way. I don't think so. Otherwise, I don't think not. I don't think not, not. So it's quite a complex kind of a thing written. We don't know how true authentic it is, but the Buddhist sources are the only sources through which we know what they perhaps said. So the technical uh, understanding of the 
statement comes out here. So what Sanjay was doing was, Sanjay apparently from his statement believed that all assertions that we can do, whether they are of, of any reality, can be done in four ways. Either we affirm things, either we deny things, sometimes we do uh, acceptance of both the views together, sometimes we say partially we accept A and partially we accept B or not A. Sometimes we make a contradictory real, uh, suppositions and the fourth is that we don't accept any. So neither this nor that, I don't accept any position. So out of all these four positions, Sanjay to each one of them had a five-fold response. That is, I do not say it is this, I do not say it is that, otherwise not and not of not. Now this seems like a very complex formula on which I worked for years and tried to understand what exactly it means and what is it. It's looking very cumbersome at its face value, but does it have any fruit or merit? And what perhaps was the significance of such an utterance? So uh, the point was here is that if you see carefully all these statements uh, given by Sanjay in the Panchakoti or the Pentalemma there for each of these possible statements that we could occur, you will find the statement is TP me no, which basically is I do not say. That's a very important point to hold in the thought. So uh, what I worked upon was a bit of analysis of the language and I found that Sanjay's utterances were largely elocutionary in nature rather than propositional. To put it, this is a little technical, but we have to get into it to understand what he was trying to do because he seems to be a quite fine logician. So what he did said was that uh, when we are, you know, uh, uh, proposing same things, there are two ways of uttering things. One is in which we accept and state things clearly, and uh, and we accept or we affirm that we uh, we hold something to be true or we hold something to be false. There is another way to talk about things, and that is through elocutionary negations, where I say that I I I just don't affirm to deny or affirm, but I deny the very act of affirming and denying. So where I can say in the former way, I was saying I say X is or I say X is not. Sanjay was saying I do not say X is, I do not say X is not. So moving on to this point, where most thinkers in philosophy, while they were writing or speaking, were trying to give some truth in a statement of a proposition form, proposing things that I say X is or I say X is not, Sanjay was not making any commitment to any position. So where we see if I say I say X is not and I say I say X is, there is a contradiction there because I'm affirming something to be X, uh, uh, true and at the same time affirming something to be false. However, in the latter distinction, which was used by Sanjay, we see he said, I do not say X is, so there's no commitment towards X being something and there was no commitment of X being not something. So when I utter both these statements together, I don't make a contradiction. I don't make a contradiction. And this point is very significant in Sanjay's method because when he was asked that, are you claiming that you are not claiming anything? There was no contradiction coming when he admitted, no, I don't claim that. Because the statement utters were not were responses, but not propositions. There was a response. Sanjay was not silent to these questions. He had a response, but this response was in the form of elocution, saying of non-commitment rather than proposing. So anyways, so in the text, we find a lot of important questions addressed to Sanjay throughout the text in the Theravada and the uh, Mahayana texts. So there were a lot of questions like the way we have questions which were uh, asked to Buddha also. And uh, there are 14 very popular, 14 unanswerable questions in the Buddhist tradition that uh, uh, were received by the Buddha in, through silence, the noble silence. Sanjay also had these questions. Now, in the various texts, which I can enumerate later, perhaps, these were the questions that were asked. So there were questions on related to on this world and live life which Sanjay did not answer and deliberately responded that I will not answer or I'll not, I do not say anything about them. Then of course, because it was a uh, Chatushkoti method, so each question has been written in its affirmation, negation, both in its denial form. So question on this world and live life. So if you were asked, is this, is there a life? Are we really truly living? Are we alive? Is this world real? Then question were then that question was suspended in that fivefold way. If there is no life, 
is there no world is this all fake and real illusion no response is it both is it neither no response response is there but there's no response in the sense of answering the question in a propositional manner then the second question were questions on afterlife aff affirming negation both and neither sanjay did not respond to say anything about them that any one of them is true or false the third question was on rebirth he was asked that are there beings who are spontaneously reborn that means after we are dead are we reborn again he did not are we not reborn that means is this is the only life and we are dead after that is it both that we are reborn and we are not reborn or is it neither no again he said i do not say anything to these questions then question on karma is law of karma there not there both there and not there neither there nor not there again the response of sanjay was i do not say any claim that you ask me which perhaps is expected to be the case further the next question was on the mortality and the immortality of the liberated one because there were many traditions where in the sects they were many people were considered liberated so the titles like mahavir buddha and even the uh, you know the uh, the great uh, even the makhali goshala was considered the liberated soul in the jivika sects were considered to be liberated so the question arose in the followers what happened to them after they are liberated so these questions were also suspended by sanjay and the next question was what are the fruits of becoming a monk or an ascetic that's such an important question which of course is addressed in great detail by lord buddha and of course by all other sects and trying to in their own various ways trying to tell what are the benefits of becoming an ascetic how it helps you sanjay did not respond even to those questions so he is a very different kind of a figure and i think i stands totally apart and in a way it sounds kind of idiosyncratic and strange because what is he doing and anyways then the next question was do you claim to be the awakened one because many followers asked him do you in any way hold that you know or you are somewhere or have enlightened yourself and you are aware of some truths so if to that also he did not accept, said anything but suspended judgment so whether you claim to have awakened to the excel right self awakening i do not say anything have you not do you claim that you have not i do not claim anything and the next question was on the purpose goal or end of things is there a purpose or end behind things or life or this world again no response so there were series of questions which are very important to philosophy sanjay has been suspending and kind of equivocating through them so because of this approach buddhist texts uh, and a uh, lot of scholars of buddhas uh, you know the tradition buddha called sanjay with these three labels they were called as a, he was called as a maravikhepika he was called as a aviruddhaka and he was called as a vedantik so a maravik hepika basically is somebody who constantly equivocates and escape making any affirmative negative both or neither claim so you are hearing something from a person but he is like a slippery fish so the moment you try to catch the thought it slips out of your hand so you know there is an utterance but what it means and where i lead to through that what i can where i can catch him that he is uttering this you can't do that it's a it's a mental slipping that was happening there then so he was called uh, and as the avara vikhepa amara means endless and vikhepa means somebody who equates forever escapes giving answers forever then he was called as aviruddhaka because at one level he was not affirming any truth but he was also not denying any truth so the tradition called him as a non rival thinker since sanjay neither claims to accept any position nor claims to deny any position and only questions about the claims made by others he is not seen as a rival thinker as against those who denied other philosophical positions and critique critique them the whole tradition of shastra that existed where there was a paksha and there purva paksha and there was an uttar paksha there was a debate that we don't agree with this but we agree with that say for example about no soul or self being eternal or not being eternal or the world being real or unreal and all these questions karma being there or not being there free will being there or not being there and so on and so forth so he was like that and he was called as a vedantik vedantik is a form of a debate where you are discussing and debating about somebody but you don't have a position the person who do not have a position of himself or herself while debating is called a vedantik 
Now, in the many traditions, Vedantic is not considered as a good debate because it's considered unfair because one has a position to argue and prove the other doesn't. So, uh, but it's very interesting, and I'll see that it is not so negative, perhaps, for a person to ask and ask and discuss questions without uh, holding a position because. Uh, we find that also in the Western philosophy, in the tradition of Socrates. And we also find in all learners who are trying to seek knowledge, they also have no positions, but they while trying to learn, question their masters to know things and debate with them. So moving on with these titles, I come to the summarization of the dialectical method, which is very detailed, complex because of the formula, but here because of the scarcity of the time and the fact that I have to address everybody who are from philosophy and from not from philosophy, I have kind of explained the whole dialectical method under which Sanjay was trying to say something in a, in a very indirect way. So what was the dialectical method was like? The method was that if suppose somebody said or if someone, Sanjay was asked that you believe that there is something real but you but it cannot be expressed. It's not expressed. So it's not that I am saying it cannot be expressed, but I know something in my mind forever, but I never talk about it. Is that something that you believe? Like maybe mystics, because they know something, but nobody knows what they think. They never say anything about it. They don't even say that they don't know about it, anything about it, or they can't be, or it can't be described. So Sanjay does not accept that. The second point is, okay, you hold something to be real, some truth to be real, and but you think it is not accepted. It cannot be described. You, you express that there is something, but we can't tell you what it is. We can't talk about it. It's beyond name and form. It's beyond language. Or perhaps it, it is beyond the intellect to be described or whatever. Uh, so that is also not the position of Sanjay. He would suspend judgments there again. The example that I have taken is the Anirvachaniya idea in the Advaita Vedanta, where they believe that the ultimate reality can only be described through Neti Neti, that it is not, it is not. You can't have an affirmative stand for it. Then the next is the negation or the alternate version of the above position. So fine, maybe you don't believe in this form, but maybe you believe in another form of X reality, which can be unexpressed. That could be in this Avyaktavya in the general uh, uh, logic theory also of indescribability. So you don't believe perhaps reality, which could not be expressed in the Advaitic way, but maybe the Jain way. No, that's also not the case. Then, okay, fine. So then you hold maybe that something is real and describable, like, for example, eternalism theory of Pakuda uh, Kachayana, Shashwatwad, who says that yes, everything is eternal. No. Then the next is, okay, maybe you are negating the, uh, okay, you negate or alternate version of the other position. That means, okay, you don't believe in eternalism, but you maybe you believe in accidentalism. So you don't believe in a philosophy A, but you maybe believe in philosophy B. That okay, I don't believe in Purana Pakuda Kachana, I believe in maybe uh, uh, Charvakin Jadrichwad of accidentalism theory that everything is happening by chance, or maybe the absolute fatalism of uh, Ajivikas that is also not accepted. Then the sixth version is the fourth position. I would like you to hold the fourth position where you hold something to be there. So another alternative version of the fourth position could be that, okay, it's not the eternalism of now Pakuta Kachayana, but maybe it is of Parmenides, who also held an eternalistic view in Greek philosophy. So maybe a philosopher is eternal view, you don't believe, but maybe you believe an alternate version of some eternal view. That is also not admitted. Then the next is contradictory to fourth position. Okay, so maybe after all this, I see you don't believe that, but maybe you believe the contradictory position. That is exactly opposite position to it. Maybe you believe in... Uh, the uh, annihilationism or uh, theory that everything will perish, the opposite view of eternalism that is also not accepted or claimed to be. Then the next is okay, since nothing is accepted and claimed to be taken, so perhaps negation of all views is your view that is also not accepted in the dialectical technique. And then finally, since nothing of the above from one to eight is claimed or negated, so hence both are accepted, that means is and is not because. You are admitting at one level that nothing is accepted, but you accept the fact that nothing is accepted. So it's a kind of saying that nothing is there, but nothing is there is there. So if you are holding that, no, that is also not held. The whole jargon of the intellectual, uh, you know, thoughts that exist in debates. 
like for example one way to explain this is also like the common question that is asked in jain theory is that if everything is relativistic then isn't your statement relativistic that kind of a meta argument is also not admitted or trapped within the sanjay's position on number eight then number nine says since oh, i'm so sorry number 10 is the summarized form of the dialectic is since nothing of the above is claimed negated or both claimed or negated the position is none of the above so you're trying to say i don't agree with any one of these positions and therefore perhaps i want to say i want to claim that i'm a nihilist of sorts or i am trying i'm trying to say there's nothing exists that is also denied so if you see it is very difficult from the dialectical method of sanjay which i very briefly put it's much more detailed and much more complex and rich and needs more explanation but i wouldn't take more time it is something which is kind of maneuvering out itself from anything that you can attribute to him now uh, in the in the maha in the uh, later tradition of the buddhist also one very celebrated thinker we all know him nagarjun he also mentions buddha in the text of uh, you know mahapragya paramita shastra who is unfortunately pali's text is lost but we have the tibetan and the Chinese uh, translations, which, and you know, the great scholar Kumara Jeev translated the text. In that, there is an interpretation, of course, a lot of translations, where Nagarjuna talks of Sanjay. So the situation is that Buddha's former two, four foremost disciples, uh, you know, Sariputta and Mahamoggalan, were the were disciples of Sanjay initially. And as per the tradition goes, they left the tutelage of Sanjay and went to Buddha. So, Sanjay is considered to be the first teacher of these two most important disciples of Buddha. So, in what happens is in the Mahavagga and in the Mahapragya Paramita Shastra, that is both in the Pali and the Chinese and Tibetan tradition, this story is narrated where, uh, uh, you know, Sariputta and Mahamogalana goes to Sanjay and tell them that we have had under you for a long time and we would like to know what we get out of it, where we will go. And is there a goal to achieve what I'm going to get out of it? I need some peace. I need some direction. And Sanjay responds to them as per Nagarjuna's, if you believe the translation. After spending long years seeking the path, I do not even claim whether the truth of the path, Mark Fal, exists or not. I am not the man you need. I say that I do not claim anything. I do not claim to have found nothing. So perhaps it seems like the, the, the interpretations are many. One interpretation is that Sanjay is shown as an ignorant being. He is seeking, but he doesn't know. So he says, I'm not the right person. You can go to somebody else who perhaps can give you a better truth. And in the later Buddhist traditions, he's shown in a positive light. He's shown to precursor to the, the thought. And he is said to have been actually promoting both these scholars to go to Buddha. In the ancient tradition, however, the Theravadan or the Hinayana tradition, he's shown more in a negative light. He's shown that he's actually ignorant and a Gyanavadan and he knows nothing and therefore he is just trying to artificially stop these two students to go to Buddha. The third interpretation which I believe was that perhaps the question to ask what is the path that I can follow is something which cannot be expected from Sanjay to ask in the first place. Who is consistently suspending judgments on any position to ask the question that what is the path out of that is kind of an oxymoronic thing to do because there seems to be a very indirect teaching that comes from Sanjay that you know that the very thing that he's trying to escape you're asking that to him. So perhaps that could be that he allowed or he said this that you should go. Because if you're really looking for something which looks for some sort of an affirmation or truth, and that's fine if because he's neither denying any truth, you can go to him. So that's the story. And then, you know, the, the question comes is, what is the benefit of doing this and why Sanjay was doing that? That I will talk in the conclusion a bit, but very quickly, I'll say that, uh, you know, Sanjay what was doing was one thing, but there were other schools also, as I told you. The Gyan Darshan was not restricted only to Sanjay, but there were other, uh, you know, okay, there were other, uh, you know, uh, sects also here and there. So in the Bodha text, we find three more schools talking about this kind of approach of suspending judgments and not making any claims. But the, all these three schools were interesting 
which were not a part of Sanjay's school of thought, they were basically having a reason to do that. They were declaring a reason to do that. So the first school said to avoid intellectual debates and friction that they create as ideological beliefs are mostly irreconcilable due to privation of knowledge. So the first school thought that no matter what you know, you somehow are always limited in your knowledge. So when you debate, you lead to intellectual debates and friction. And that can cause, uh, you know, uh, some sort of resistance and a discomfort in the intellect of peace. So we suspend judgments and hold beliefs. The second school did not do this reasons because they wanted to, uh, they believe that what we believe today will definitely can change tomorrow. So what I know today will not be maybe the same beliefs that I will have in, in 20 years later. So it's better not to later think that I made a mistake of holding something. Rather, entertain all views but don't take a stand on any and be uh, you know uh, a kind of a uh, you know Amar Vedic Hepika to all. So in, listen to all, read all, understand all but don't claim that you accept or reject or both or either any. And so this was the second school's purpose. The third school's purpose was that very similar to Jaina thought that if when we are actually having multiple positions we debate and we become violent towards each other because in thought it, it is happening that one school accepts one idea and the other doesn't and somehow there is there is a there is a strong effort to make a compromise between the, uh, opposite ideas so in order to avoid that and do a double exertion of the mind and emotion just let suspend judgments in the first place the fourth school of sanjay is peculiar and it is one of the only schools i believe very rare schools which do not even claim directly why it was doing it. So the fourth school says, uh, I mean, I read it quickly. The school of Sanjay Bilati Putta suspended judgment when he was asked about the purpose of suspension of judgment. Perhaps this was because to state a purpose also somewhere except some judgment that you must suspend ultimately. So, you know, the point here was that if you're doing it, you're falling into the same trap. The very the very thought or the act that you want to do, not to take a position, you will end up taking it if you hold a purpose. So uh, I'm I'm having less of time, so I'll quickly wrap it up now. So uh, so the point here is that we generally find that people accept certain ideas or beliefs, like they will claim themselves with certain identities. That maybe I am a I'm a Christian, I'm a Hindu, or I'm a believer of reality. I'm not a believer of reality. Or maybe so there are two ways: either we accept certain positions or we deny certain positions, and with these uh, uh, beliefs, we have two ways. Either we are persuaded to believe those or we have proven to believe those or experienced to believe those in some ways. Now, if there is any restriction in that, in any way, we don't know who decides that, then it leads to propositions and conflict. So if you're persuading somebody, but the persuasion is not complete and there is another influence also coming from him, then there can be conflict in ideas. So the, the approach could be that perhaps we tolerate all ideas like it was in Jaina and other thoughts and see the plurality and accept little, little all of them and try to do that. But that's more of a compromise. So the best solution perhaps Sanjay was trying to say as a significance was that let's explore the new possibilities of ideas, entertain each idea without accepting or denying anything. And that leads to peace, to the possibilities, to interpretations. So a free mind is the one which does not hold any view and accept it in that way. And that's perhaps is the imbibing that one should do. That's one thing which we indirectly assume. Being a scholar, I can think that what Sanjay could have said. Although Sanjay in the text has not said anything about why he does it. But this is just the way we try to see the significance of his thought. Finally, uh, these are the benefits. I'll skip it because there's not much time, but I'll keep this slide. So what is the benefit of holding such kind of an approach or the dialectical method in learning is perhaps that you can have an egalitarian approach. You see all views equally. You're not emotionally bent or intellectually bent to one over the other. You are exploratory in nature in a truest sense. Because your influences of the past, your influences of those arguments which looks convincing, your experiences of the self will not, you know, influence you in a way to have one view preference over the other. The next is the agnostic approach, which allows uh, you to accept and reject, uh, entertain things without accepting things. And the last is the logical approach, which I would read. 
it's one avoids being judgmental and committing fallacies or faulty generalization which otherwise come up as a prejudice and biases if you believe something dogmatically and justify it then you may face issues in entertaining beliefs that you do not believe and true wisdom lies in understanding a thought without accepting or rejecting it so i believe agyan darshan thought that it is impossible for a person psychologically to actually have a, a, a personal inclination to a thought and to be fair to the opposite thought perhaps so in the conclusion uh, i would just like to state that uh, can i take few minutes to conclude thank you so uh, i will just read because i think that's the only way i can put such a difficult thinker into line sanjay's approach to philosophical question is not about questions themselves perhaps as i interpret but to the answer to the questions that are given by philosophers where each philosophers minimally maintain some philosophical position or others to justify all sorts of their given responses ending up in intellectual violence and debates of sorts to prove their stand going even to the level of arguing for the best possible state of human mind that undermined mental equanimity sanjay methods perhaps though i do not endorse can be seen as a hint that philosophy is to be done not for the sake of answering the questions but the sake of questioning itself and to see the importance of the idea itself the art of philosophical questioning is a wonder in itself which arises from personal experiences thought and from the observation of the universe and this wonder arises out of curiosity familiarity and simultaneous unfamiliarity with the object in consideration thence the wonder and philosophical joy lie is not seeking the answers to the fundamental questions and getting done with them but in wonder of contemplating the question and wondering if there could ever be an answer to it without passing a judgment and this withholding of passing a judgment is again withheld if it is seen as passing off a judgment it is acknowledged only if it is seen as an elocutionary response this elocutionary response i admit it as as an elocutionary affirmation sanjay perhaps wanted us to indirectly realize that humans and language both have this tendency to slip or fall into some or the other kind of conclusions be what it may even if one has a neutral or aversive or any other attitude towards making a conclusion sanjay in order to abstain himself from all positive negative and neutral attitudes follows his dialectical methods in across debates and discussions and this is not a conclusion rather an attempt to avoid a conclusion without making a counter to a conclusion so one should not think that this is his philosophy there is no philosophy here there is only a method here comes a seeker unless he has thought something can conclude anything whatsoever so moving on if it appears that sanjay's philosophy though was popular in his time and even though it significantly was discussed though not rejected or negated with other existing schools of thought with time slowly it got declined presumably this was because unlike the conventional and traditional teachings of the time his philosophy was devoid of any prescriptions and strict guidance and did not make any promises about each achieving any fruition of results by following his teachings and since the tradition goes in such a way that the disciples and pupils are no different than followers however unconventionally sanjay's disciples were not bound with following any prescribed outlook of knowledge and life which they needed to hold on to defend against others and this is why the tradition perhaps vanished after few centuries or with times perhaps got molded into a goal oriented philosophy if that happened then this must have led to the downfall of the school i say this because if the teachings of the school later promised any goal say of bliss or then the school of sanjay must have have become comparable to other schools of thought and one among many other schools which also promise liberation peace of mind and state of bliss numerated as moksha anand nirvana kevalya ahimsa swarg etc and surely these other school intensity of subjecting themselves into some moral and blissful end must have superseded by the intensity of later sanjay school if it existed just like in greece the school of pyro you know the greek philosopher pyro advocated suspension of judgment also all right he believed that if you suspend judgment you achieve ataraxia the mental equanimity and peace also matching with the second school of agyana so what happened was he faced rivalry when pyro advocated that we should suspend judgment and no one make any claims and therefore it brings peace to us he faced rivalry with schools contemporary schools of democritus which value euthymia which is cheerfulness 
Stoicism school of Zeno of Saitio, which valued apathia, that is indifference to passions, and as the blessed state. Hedonistic school of Epicurus, which aimed for eponia, that is pleasure and uh, happiness, and the Aristotle's teleological school of eudaimonia, the ultimate state of happiness. So, uh, what I'm trying to say here is this Piro, because he stated the objective of suspension of judgment, got the, the whole purpose of what he wanted to teach got defeated, and he got into the debate and proving that my way of giving philosophy is of giving you the best state of being. And there the debate started again in affirming the fact that my philosophy is best and not yours, or even if it is yours, fine, but my gives this and should be read. So Sanjay, as I say, must have been even been beyond such debates and therefore would have suspended judgments on firstly, whether there is any valuable state or end achieved by following his method, and secondly, on the nature of that value and end. If Sanjay would not have done this, then he would have not, then he would have been again just like others who were debating with each other about what is the nature of truth and what do we get out of it. And so even though Pirro also suspends judgments in Greek philosophy, he nonetheless landed up again in controversy with others about which state is being is best and which among all is the best way of life. So it appears better to suspend judgments and even suspend that insofar it is taken as an essential position and be free to experience, wonder, be in humility, tranquility, and to rejoice in what you have in front of you. So I conclude with that. Thank you. Audience, I think now, guys. Okay, thank you so much, um, Doctor Anishi. Uh, we see that the um, this is yes. There are many. Um, Dr. Anish supervises here and also the colleagues, the students and the others, the, the students and the participants of Tibet House classes, philosophy classes and um, they, particularly those of us who are from Tibet House, you may be hearing this for the first time, which is so important and um, so as the as a part of the the purpose delineated to avoid conflicts to avoid you know say the uh the proving your view as correct others as the inferior and so forth um we see that the this great purpose there and uh, the approach is very different so before we wind up, I'd like to entertain one or two questions if you have, because that uh, the daughter Anishi really put so much effort in this, and I would say that the as he rightly indicated that this whole system declined, and now if you want to ask, we have to ask somebody who really put effort in this, and we see that daughter. The Anishi spent so many years in this and really put effort because these materials are not easily available and as a, as a system, but from the Buddhist sources and the Jaina sources. And besides this, we don't see even the we don't see the documents as well. So therefore, any questions that you might have, feel free because this the Dora Anishi is the right person. Any questions, please raise hands. No question. Okay, one over there, the girl there. What does the suspension of judgment do to uh, moral claims and ethics and moral judgments? There is a question that he suspends answers to. <laughs> So yes, uh, so if you see during my presentation, I uh, shared one of the questions which talked about law of karma. So law of karma is in some sense affected to the idea that uh, what are the consequences of good and bad actions and are there any good or bad actions in the first place? So all these kinds of questions are again suspended 
uh, because we also saw that one of the five workers who were there in the tradition, they, one of them was a moralist. So he believed that there is no more, there are, there is no such thing as good and bad. There are artificial creations out of pain and pleasures of people. So clearly that's a position taken, but Sanjay would not have admitted any moral ground, but having, uh, or would have suspended judgments on that, not that he's negating it or accepting it, would have evaded any sort of answer to it. Uh, especially if there was a, an attempt to make a, a, a grounded theory of ethics or morality out of that. Having said that, uh, but what about, uh, uh, you know, the immediate experiences that one has in lived life where one feels sorrow or happiness or pain or pleasure? Can we minimally call that as good and bad? Well, I believe in so far there is no uh, set of theorizing, holding of a position in a way that it can be considered as a view which could be continuously accepted, that is avoided. But of course, if you pinch yourself, you do feel pain. So you do admit at the first level that there is a pain if I pinch myself. But if it is really the pain, am I really feeling the pain? Am I not feeling the pain? That is suspended there because th that's, a, that's a second order question in a way because we are trying to know that what our experience, are we brain in the vat or are we really experiencing what we are? That is not answered. So so the more so I believe everyday situations he was not so aloof from reality I believe to would have said that no there is no I don't want to say if you are in pain or if you're not in pain but he would mean that the moment you're trying to come up with an answer which uh, or sorry a view which is holding something to be consistently there as a basis to rely upon and develop something out of it would have been suspended because that's a position you're taking to. The question, yeah, I mean, uh, that's a that's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, I believe uh, many a times we, uh, if it is not uh, in the intention matters, I believe if the intention is not to, as far as I understand the thinker, if the intention is not to uh, ex understand morality in terms of holding it to be as a basis of understanding everything and held, making it as a view theory, it is fine to do that. So I can admit that, uh, like I can say that 10 people are in pain, so we should not harm them. That's not denied. Nowhere that's not denied. Because in any case, Sanjay is not denying anything either. But the point here is, but the moment you say that this is how it should be for all, or is the basis of a better understanding over another, is the problem. So one has to be very, I believe in one way I see from contemporary standpoint, so I don't know how much I can attribute it to him, but now I'm only talking of the method. It's very phenomenological in many, many ways uh, because you you don't try to see the essences of things, but rather you see the more of the experiences and the existential things of people and then you try to just understand it. So you don't have the essence and therefore you believe in good, but because you experience certain, you generally just take that as that, as that time. So you're not swept away with it because you do, you're not dead. You're not a, you're not a dead person. You do experience things there. So, yeah. Yes. I'm going into the top. If you want anything, what you would have thought about Ukraine was? Oh, okay. That's so, I believe, uh, firstly, we have to understand that, uh, he was an ascetic. He was actually a recluse thinker. So in all the, though he suspended judgments on the answer, what are the fruits of becoming an ascetic? He was actually, uh, as for all the sources gathered that I have gathered from various, say, uh, you know, sutras, he is actually a, uh, has a withdrawal from the life of the, you know, politics and the life of the world. So he, uh, you know, has been shown to be actually living in arms, you know, living minimally with arms, having hardly wearing any clothes, sitting in the forest for a long time, and very occasionally visiting towns and cities, very rarely, unless, you know, there is some need, I don't know if there, I don't know, we have to see the historical tradition there. So I think 
uh, asking that what he would think of the Ukrainian war. First of all, the question is, what is asked about the Ukrainian war? Is it real, unreal, what? So if you are asking the point that war should not be done, is that a question? Has suffering. I'm so sorry. Suffering. The people are suffering that we all can see. Whether you name it in Ukraine war or China Pakistan war, China India, the people are suffering. So taking his position, what I learned from your talk, means I'll not get an answer. He'll not take a position. Either way. You will get the answer, but the question is if you're asking that is suffering, uh, you know, you're suffering. Nobody can, I mean, who is Sanjay to tell whether anybody is suffering or not? The people know themselves, first of all, that they are suffering or not. If you're asking him, he would say, I believe, as much as I understand, he's a very difficult thinker. But I would say, I think he would not deny the fact that nobody is suffering. He would not admit the fact that anybody is suffering. Firstly, because that's not what he is facing, first of all. Secondly, I believe, in so far, suffering is talked about. The moment you are holding a view that these things leads to suffering endlessly, eternally, and this is a view that leads to problems, that is what he will suspend judgment through. But he will not deny the fact there is suffering, not at all. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for your talk, Dr. Anish. Um, I want to just ask one question related to the last part of your presentation where you talked about what are the things, maybe benefits, okay, that we can probably derive from the method of, uh, you know, Sanjay's method of suspension of judgment. And clearly these are derivatives because he doesn't take any stand on um, any benefit whatsoever that this method can have. So my question is, do you think that um, this could lead either to uh, or this, you know, if suppose I do want to pursue this method, uh, you know, um, and, and do you think it would eventually be a very private pursuit of philosophy? One. Secondly, um, an extension to this question, um, would do you think that I would be committing an untruth to the method itself if I actually start believing in a benefit of this method and pursue it therefore so yeah thank you uh, as far as the word private is concerned see uh, in sanjay's thought there is no initiation to form an organization to endorse a thought because there is no uh, explicit uh, a goal or target to achieve and in fact the the students are absolutely free to uh, uh disciples are like, absolutely free to uh you know, uh, take the interpret the method and seek their own truths if they believe in any. Now, so in that sense, it is clearly a, a, a thing which is not coming from anybody because he, he doesn't even say that you take my method and follow it. He doesn't even say you don't take my method and follow it. He just says it. So if you seek and pursue for your own sake, you have something in your mind to do that, you can. And secondly, talking about the fact that uh, your second question was that how philosophy, uh, yes. Uh, see the, uh, because it is not supposed to have, you know, any benefit first and then in light of that, I pursue it. I believe if you are having a goal already that this will lead to me a benefit, it's a problem there because problem because it is going against the methodolo methodology of the method, not because he's stating it's a problem if you have a goal, but the methodology doesn't suggest that anywhere. So I believe it is this that you you engage with the idea and if you get anything out of it, that will come later. You can't have a kind of a precondition and as all determination is negation. If we determine that we will be benefited out of it, I'm sorry, even if it sounds profitable, we are determining ourselves and negating ourselves from the other ideas that could have entertained in our minds. So, you know, so as much as a, a restricted is a person who believes that there will be uh, harm, as much restricted in thought is a person who thinks I'll only gain. The true free person is who is not prioritizing or conditioning himself to gain or harm in their thoughts but open to all sorts of things and see. And that's the real sense of a philosophical daring, I would suggest. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Next question. Okay. Um, I'm completely out of my depth here. 
<laughs> because I've been studying Buddhist philosophy and this, you know, four noble, starting with the four noble truths and the different types of seekers. Uh, but so I have two questions, if I may put them together before you answer. One is uh, an odd question, like if he neither affirmed, he was already a mature teacher. So if he neither affirmed or denied any position, then what was the purpose of that ascetic life? What did he feel was something that he could perhaps keep or achieve by just living in the forest as an ascetic? You know, like the Epicureans and others. And the second thing is when you said that uh, Shariputra was, he was a teacher of Shariputra, who later almost immediately must have become a disciple of the Buddha. So even in, I haven't studied this, but um, in our Nalanda Master's courses, but there were these questions, 14 questions that the Buddha wouldn't answer, not, not taking any position on them, or at least perhaps not feeling that people were ready for any kind of position on those things, assertion or denial. So did you, since your sources were mostly Buddhist, did you find anything that could be a slight echo of this method in the later Buddhist teachings, in the Pragyaparamita, for example? All right, thank you. So uh, answering your first question, uh, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your first question. I'm so sorry. Uh, if he had adopted this position of neither affirming yes. nor denying anything, what purpose of living in the forest as an ascetic, what could he be meditating yes. on except yes. meeting people who had similar problems and yes. coming to him? But he could never give them an answer they could have been happy with. Yes. That is the first question. Yeah, the question saying that if he doesn't deny or accept anything, again, actually, you know, because of the uh, problem of going into depth and detail in the ways we express about his philosophy, his eye method, this is a problem that's happening. So when I say he doesn't deny and accept anything, it seems in the very assumption uh, statement that it, this seems to be the position. But we have to understand that when I'm saying, or when he says, or when we interpret him as saying that, he neither commits himself to affirm or deny anything. All he's trying to say here is not that I don't have to be an ascetic or I have to be an ascetic. The question is that the answer to what you gain or be as an ascetic will not come from the teacher, will not come as a guidance from the teacher directly. Because the moment a thought comes to you from somebody whom you think is revered, river, rivering, is something to be, someone to be revered, someone whom you hold, hold to be having a lot of value. Your autonomous thinking to be able to discover that would be influenced. So apparently, if he told that I'm an ascetic because of this or because of that, or I'm not an ascetic because of this, I'm not, I'm actually inflowing the thought that I have on you. So the, so the point is not that there is no merit or demerit of becoming an ascetic. The point is that wouldn't be expressed to the student. And this is the teaching that the student has to understand what it could be from his own free, true spirit of what he has or she has. Because the, uh, this is a very non way of doing philosophy because the school never had any text, never had any initiate. There is no initiation to the follower to do certain things or do that, to be in a certain way. But that does not mean that there is, that the initiation is denied. That there is, that I'm saying that don't have an initiation. The question is, it will not come from an, an extrinsic mean. It will not come from the outside. And then trying to make you realize that yes, it is the truth in you. It has to be discovered by you. So, you know, the, the, so there is the thing and you have to follow the puzzle sort of a thing, you know, on your own maybe. So that's the virtue that I think is there. Because the moment any thought is embedded in your mind, we get influenced with it. Then it's a di very difficult question to say that are we independently, autonomously accepting it because it is the truth or is it because it is coming from somebody? So that autonomy of the disciple is retained by not holding the merits or demerits of becoming an ascetic. Because he discovers that truth, maybe if he has to, again, 
on his own. I hope that kind of answer. Yes, yes. Uh, no, across traditions, first Pali, then Sanskrit, then Tibetan, and then Chinese. Thanks to Buddhism, because it spread in Eastern Asia, all these texts were translated and commentaries were written, and one one paragraphs on Sanjay's thought was also interpreted. So, there is a lot of yes uh well uh, there is uh i'll tell you one thing that uh in the earlier tradition sanjay is shown in a very negative light but in the latter tra later traditions of the tibetan and the chinese he is shown in a very positive light although he is regarded continuously as a non-buddhist thinker but he is shown in a very positive light though the statement has been the same the statement has not been fabricated largely but uh, but yes, various translations have made things different also. But overall thought is similar. But yes, the character, the, the assassination of the character was done a lot in the earlier times, but the later doesn't do it. But again, these are very difficult statements to make because in later traditions also you find critics of him somewhere. But overall, there is a sympathetic attitude towards him and all other heretical teachers as compared to the earlier part where but i'm again not saying that that was better or this is better i'm just holding that what i found in these throughout journeys from 6th 4th century bc on to 8th century ad those 1200 years that these texts migrated to the east and were translated and commentated from the pali to the dirgagams of the chinese this happened so yeah i'm so sorry i've taken a lot of time um Dr. Anishi, one question to you is, do you believe that the, that he believes, he believes that no view should be the best? Do you believe that he believes, Sanjay believed that no, no view should be the best? Uh, I I don't would I would not make that claim because uh, because I really don't know what he thought. I can only say from the method. In fact, in my thesis, I argued, and uh, you know, uh, Krishna sir knows about this because he was my supervisor. Uh, I have clearly stated that I am not trying to tell exactly what Sanjay believed. All, all I'm trying to do is, in an objective manner, trying to understand the method. If somebody tells me historically, because I'm not a historian, I'm a person from philosophy, so if somebody tells me this method is not of Sanjay and you have read historical sources wrongly, I would be okay to accept even that. I, but I, my focus is on the method, is on the teaching, rather than what the person really thought. Now, this is a problem. I totally, sir, has asked a very important question that do I believe that he believed that. No, I can't say anything about it. <laughs> it's very... uh, the so reason why I I ask this is that the um, what he said is how you interpret it because the what Dora Anishi he did this is amazing work it was not that easy because even in the Buddhist philosophy say the there are the four Buddhist schools and when we just when we go through the debates among these two these different schools then we go into the nuances when it comes to the nuances then what would these different schools would say we can just conjecture we can't there are areas where we get stuck there we can't really personify their thoughts so in this connection what i'm the what i like to share with you here is that in your discussion what you said is that the they try to deliberately stay away from these different views because with the views, you are not your mind is not freed. So no view is the freedom of the mind. So the error, the what the lady there asks, the purpose. It is like to free your mind. That is a purpose what they hold. If the freedom of the mind, if this is the the purpose, then they advocate a the purpose. So because they say that the implicitly they are saying that. Hold no views, your mind will be freed. So there is purpose. So although they say, do you have a purpose? I don't accept it. 
There's no purpose. I don't. De- I don't deny it. Although they said it, but the purpose is already implicitly implied. Number one. Number two. No view. Is that the view or not? Is that the question? Holding no view. Is that my view? Is no view? Is that the view or not? This is ended the question. So I know that these are. Um, yeah, these are endless discussions. Well, uh, holding no view would be a position of. There is another very important figure, a uh, very lesser-known figure, Diganak. Uh, he maintained and debated with Buddha in uh, the Diganaka Sutta that I hold no view. You would say anything, I deny it. He was a stubborn young man portrayed in the Diganaka Sutta, and he argues with Buddha. And he says, I don't believe in any view. And then the, 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 the sutta goes on and he shows and finally he realizes that this is a very uh, uh, epistemologically, uh, logically, as well as uh, pers- uh, mentally, uh, uh, emotionally, it's a difficult position, uh, an impossible position. And then he finally becomes a disciple of Buddha. So having a philosophy of no view, I believe, is not really what I was trying to say for Sanjay. Uh, because no view is again a view, or in a way, because you are holding there is no. I'm Sanjay would say, I do not say there is no view. <laughs> so the point is, you have to see it as a method, not as a philosophy. You have to see as a whether you are a Buddhist, whether you are a non-Buddhist, whether you're a Hindu, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're a poor, whether you're rich. This is a method that one can adopt. It does not have any. Philosophy, philosophy. When we say way of life, or you know, uh, a, a way which leads you to some blessedness, a surety of things, that's not there. It's a method that you can take, and that actually keeps you liberated in the truest sense. I interpreted that. So, interpret liberation doesn't come from following things and doing things in a way. Maybe it does, but the more important that for you is to be mentally, spiritually, absolutely free from any kind of influences and this method helps you to do that even though you may be of any tradition because it's a method which is handy for anybody like a food is handy for everybody to eat same is with this method is handy for everybody to follow and to order because it doesn't deny anything and neither accepts anything uh, so it is it is neither interfering with any philosophy nor it's strengthening any philosophy it's completely there as you for the way you want to use it. And that I think perhaps was the indirectly the I interpret him as the teachings of this. And this school had to be lost because of course uh, uh, there is no initiation in the first place because there is no politics, there is no there is no uh, uh, you know a sense of onus or responsibility on you to continue to the tradition, to hold that the tradition is not misinterpreted and not lost or gone and merged with another or wrongly understood. There is nothing like that. And uh, even if you say that your thought is not accepted, Sanjay wouldn't have a problem there because there is nothing to defend in the first place. There's nothing to deny in the first place. So I believe, sir, that I think uh, that, you know, he is not saying that there is no view. I believe he's saying, do not say that there is no view. Do not say there is a view. And just flow with this response in your mind and move forward. Not a view. So it depends whether you treat yourself as a first person or as a second person. Secondly, those who are talking about suffering, see, you suffer because you carry a baggage of thoughts. And silence is the best wisdom, you can say the highest ultimate wisdom. So when you, let's say, you be in quietitude, right? When you be in silence, you don't suffer. As you be, when you be in deep sleep, you don't suffer. You suffer when you carry something from external world. So your thoughts, your questions, all are, you know, paining you, you know, they are, they are causing suffering to you. So his, you know, quietitude, quietitude, uh, or let's say silence philosophy is more about freeing yourself from all these, you know, external elements or internal elements, psychological or, or physical, you know, psychophysical, you know, elements, so that you can free yourself and be in you, right, in yourself, right. That is what is the idea. So it's it's about you know being quietude, nothing else, nothing else. And uh, 
I mean, the the question that has been asked about morality, you know, see, even uh, there is there is a question of morality when uh, you know people are not having that equanimity of mind. So when there are bad guys, when there are bad people, only then morality and immorality questions, you know, or debates happening, right? But when everybody is in silence, that silence in with pure mind, with your, you know, you know, the mind that is, you know, taking things in the correct form, in the right form. So then nothing will happen that cause suffering to others, right? So uh, there is no question of morality, right? In fact, it's like being as good as you can be by your essence, right? Without any burden of thoughts and, you know, prejudices and biases. So this is what I can uh, comment on this, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor, thank you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Anish Ji. And thank you. And of course, the effort is amazing. The effort Dr. Anish Ji made is just amazing. Let us all give a big round of applause to Dr. Anish Ji. <clears throat> uh, thank you. And uh, all the participants, thank you so much. And the questions are so rich. And I particularly like all these the questions are so good. Really appreciate it. And Professor, thank you for your response. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, really. Sincerely from my heart, thank you for letting me speak today here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, th Hello. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, with this, uh, we would like to conclude the session. And before concluding the session, I would like to thank Dr. Anish Chakravarti ji for such a well-defined and elaborated lecture on today's topic and bringing forward the life and teachings of this uh, lesser-known free thinker, Sanjaya Bellatiputta, uh, and also to educate all of us about the wisdom that, what can, that one can gain from his philosophical teachings and a method for a peaceful life. Thank you very much, everyone. And I would also like to thank our director, Venerable Geshe Dojan Abdullah, for blessing this session uh, with his presence and <clears throat> also uh, all the participants who are assembled here for taking active participation in this lecture. Thank you very much, everyone. With this, um, I would like to invite uh, our Director Venerable Geshe Doja Damdula to kindly offer the white scarf and the sovereigner to Dr. Anish Chagravati ji. Thank you very much. Please, Nikola. I would like to request every one of you to make a round, a big round of applause. Thank you very much. I would also like to invite Professor Krishna Ji to kindly come up. Thank you very much.